Mike, the market continues to surge higher, yet the economic data continues to go in the opposite direction. It is one of those things that people have a really hard time understanding, and it is the subject of our Capture at Uncap today. Mike, we've been watching the markets approach all-time highs again, and actually the NASDAQ, I believe, has hit an all-time high again. So as we sit here today looking at the markets, in contrast to the economic data, you know, give us some perspective on what's going on and what we see through our lens. At a, at a very you know macro level, just unpacking everything we discussed during the last cap strat uncapped, you understand why the economic data is bad. You know, before COVID nineteen happened, we we went through in in a, at at nauseum why the the global economy is extremely indebted, growth potential is is irreparably damaged, most likely, and central banks and governments are stuck in this liquidity trap, pushing on a string where they're adding more and more debt to the system and getting less and less growth from it. So we've we've unpacked the growth side, which isn't good. But now what we want to unpack is, you know, what's been happening here recently, why that doesn't necessarily mean bad things for your portfolio or for your wealth. The idea that, you know, wealth is the new growth. And, right. and that's what we're going to be outlining today. Great. Yeah. So wealth being the new growth, that wealth mattering more than growth. Um, that's one of the, the deeper things we can dive into. And it, it's very counterintuitive to everything we've been taught over the last probably 40 years, everything you learned in school, uh, everything you read and hear about in the media. And let's start with looking at why this phenomenon is happening with respect to the wealth effect. And I think this chart highlights it pretty starkly. Yeah, this chart, uh, something we showed during the last cap strat uncapped video. So just recapping here, what you have in the blue line is the monetary base, which is sort of the highest form of money, the amount of money in the economy. And this is primarily created by the central bank in the US instance, the Federal Reserve. And you can see the blue line going up and to the right. And recently here during the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, the, the Fed adding over two trillion dollars to the monetary base. Um, so the money is there. But what you're seeing, the green line going the opposite direction, that's the velocity of money. So that's how many times each dollar created, uh, how many dollars of GDP are created from that dollar of money. So if, if $1 is created, right now it creates one, $1.29 worth of GDP. But you can see how that line is falling. So more and more money is being created, less and less of it is used to create to actually buy goods and services and less and less is being used to create growth so that's the idea that was that, that we highlighted that time and the conclusion is you know we're going to be stuck pushing on a string governments are trying to stimulate central banks trying to stimulate growth is going nowhere there's too much debt in the system there there are very difficult ways to get out of this we we outline the the ways you get out of this trap and you know they're not good and they're not things people are going to sign up for politically. Um, so you take away this conclusion, well, growth is bad. Well, that should mean bad things for the stock market. But that's, that's not the case. And if you go back to the idea of a balance sheet recession or depression, you can see why that is. Um, right. And b before we go into that balance sheet recession idea and, and concept, more money is created. And so it's not buying goods and services uh, so where's that money going? Who's getting it? Where's it going? Uh, it's it's going into financial assets. So you always say price never lies. Look at the price of financial assets. Look at the S and P 500. It's basically flat year to date. Uh, look at look at bond yields anywhere in the bond universe. Low quality bonds, high quality bonds, treasuries everywhere. Uh, prices of financial assets are significantly higher. So it's clear that these dollars being created are not being used to generate GDP growth. They're being right. used to inflate asset prices. Right, which you use the word inflate and people talk about inflation and there is no inflation, but there is inflation, right? There is inflation in financial assets and it's significant. And that translates into 
other financial assets like houses, correct? And and people's brokerage accounts, et cetera. Yep. Just about anything, yeah. Great. So let's let's talk about what a balance sheet recession looks like and what it means and why it is fundamentally uh, a trap that we're stuck in. And there's a very limited number of options to get out of. Yeah. So we go to the next slide. We'll just, just recap on a high level what we're talking about here with the balance sheet recession. So you start out in the situation we're in on the left. So you look at a very stylized, simplified form of a balance sheet. And you have your assets, which are elevated, your liabilities, which are also elevated. Think about liabilities as primarily as debt. But thankfully, your the value of your assets are higher than the value of your liabilities. So you have equity. You're a going concern. You're in business. Your balance sheet balances. Everything makes sense. Um, everyone is aware of this situation. All central bankers are aware of this situation, where we're in a situation where the asset side of everyone's balance sheet is thankfully higher than their liabilities because the liabilities are so large. And they're also very aware of a situation, what would happen if the price of assets were to fall? That's what we're trying to avoid. So we put an X through that on the right. A situation where you know if, if the value of your assets gets marked down 10, 20, 30% quickly, well, you don't just get to write off liabilities. What happens is you have negative equity. Right. And, and when you're trying to pay back these liabilities, what do you have to do? You have to sell more assets. And if everybody's selling assets, the price of assets keep going down and this feeds on itself. Everybody is aware of this, that that is what needs to be avoid, uh, avoided above all else is a situation where everybody is selling assets and their prices are falling to try to meet their liabilities. And so do you think that... Uh, our government, the, the Federal Reserve System, and all the other central bankers are stimulating to keep the asset bubble inflated in order to prevent this type of event? That's exactly right. Look at the Fed's mandate. The Fed's mandate is price stability and full employment. Nowhere in their mandate does it say asset price stability. Right. There's price in terms of CPI. So that's the price of goods. But then look at their actions and how they justified them during COVID-19 talking about how they, they needed to purchase treasuries, purchase mortgage-backed securities, por- purchase uh, corporate bonds for the first time in history to restore the function of financial markets. They, they weren't talking about CPI. Right. They weren't even talking about un- unemployment. They were talking about restoring the functioning of financial markets, which how were financial markets functioning during that time? Prices were going down. So apparently to them, Functioning financial markets means prices not going down because they know in order for, if my goal is stability of prices in terms of GDP, so prices of goods and full employment, and this is everyone's balance sheet, the only way for me to accomplish those goals is to make sure these balance sheets don't get inverted. And so what you have is the case of the hammer and the nail and the Fed is the hammer. And if you're the hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm-hmm. So unemployment increases, lower interest rates, buy assets. We have a global pandemic, lower interest rates, buy asset classes, or buy assets. Oh, the market right. doesn't think we've done enough. Lower interest rates more, buy more assets. You know, every single problem to them is just another nail. And the mm-hmm. solution is always lower interest rates, buy assets, because that's the only way you can keep these balance sheets from inverting and going into a balance sheet depression. And, and at some point, maybe we're past that point, who knows, I guess, it's, it, we've, heard, we've heard different opinions here. It's almost to the point where it's irreversible, where you've gotten to the point where it would take significant, unpalatable austerity to get the balance sheet back healthy again. Yes. And there isn't, there's no amount of growth as evidenced by the last five, plus years that could solve this problem. Right. Yeah, in, in very simple math terms, say say the value of assets goes down 20% and your liabilities don't. Well, now you need to cut spending by 20% or sell more assets to pay off these liabilities. That's really hard to do. Nobody's signing up for that. But the key, the key point that we want to highlight here is what we're basically saying is the, the most powerful financial entity in the world, 
who has an unlimited capacity to buy any financial asset, minus some restrictions in the Federal Reserve Act, which apparently uh, there's gray area that we didn't know before COVID-19. But we're saying that financial entity is acting to support asset prices and reduce the cost of liabilities. So if you own assets and they're financed by liabilities, thinking, wow, what a tremendous tailwind. You know, that's a good partner to have. Uh, that's very reassuring that they are 100% focused on making sure the assets that I own, the financial assets, the prices are high. And if I run into any problem and I need to roll over my debt, well, I'll be able to do that and probably at a lower interest rate. Right. So that's why this growth situation is it's, it's very difficult. It's going to be a struggle in terms of economic growth going forward. But knowing that the Fed knows this and they're trying to avoid a balance sheet depression, if you own financial assets, this is not a bad thing for you. In fact, the worst thing for you, arguably, is what the Fed's doing actually works and actually generates growth and inflation, and they feel like they can stop. Mm -hmm. That is actually what you worry about. Right. Best case scenario is they keep doing it, thinking it's going to work, keep supporting asset prices, keep lowering the cost of liabilities. Everything looks like a nail and the hammer's just getting heavier and heavier. So, so a lot of what we just talked about is on the economic side and what we've been taught in terms of how an economy works and how that should be reflected in asset prices and, and how you pick a stock and fundamentals of why you would buy a stock because you expect that their earnings would increase over time and that you're paying a reasonable price for those those earnings that you're buying. But in this sort of different paradigm or new paradigm or the way we think about it now is that's really not the case anymore. So walk us through sort of the, the different model of supply and demand that's really we think is driving stocks. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you studied finance in college or at university you have any financial textbook, you talk about picking stocks, what you're going to see is some derivation of what we call the growth model. That economic growth, either immediately or through a lag, you know, there's a timing element that we're not going to focus on here. But generally speaking, economic growth leads to greater corporate profits, which drives stock prices higher over the long term. And so a lot of time and effort is spent trying to forecast corporate profits, because those are going to be the winners in terms of the stock market. So you model out future expected earnings, you conduct a, a strength, weaknesses, opportunities, threats analysis, all of that to try to find out who's going to have higher corporate profits. And we'll show on these next few slides, the reality is that has not worked for at least seven years now. Um, so the alternative model is what we call the wealth model. Uh, recognizing GDP growth does not buy stocks. Actually, you need money to buy stocks. So instead of starting with GDP growth, you start with an increase in the money supply. Money is created. That money leads to lower cost of capital. Think of that as lower interest rates, especially for those that already have wealth, mm -hmm. and an, an ability to roll over your debt very easily, and higher earnings per share. And we're contrasting corporate profits in the growth model to earnings per share in the wealth model. The difference is there's a denominator to earnings per share. It's earnings per share. Share is the denominator. Shares are something that can be reduced, and that inflates earnings. Right. So that's something that can be that can be worked out through this model, and that is what leads to higher stock prices and returns. The key thing is in the wealth model, GDP growth not required here, <laughs> not no. required at all. All you need is more money to be created. And when is the most money created? Well, if we go back to that original chart you would see that it's actually when economic growth is bad <laughs> Yeah, is when the most yeah, money is created. That's when the money is created. It, it, it is simple, said much more simplistically, it is supply and demand. Mm -hmm. And we've got a, a lot more money and we've got a lot fewer stocks. So you've got more money chasing fewer stocks, so prices go up. Exactly. exactly. And you have, you have far fewer investment opportunities. So you have the Fed pushing you out of markets and pushing you into fewer and fewer investment opportunities. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, and so, so we can prove this out very easily in charts. I mean, if you go through the growth model, which we show on the next slide, you can see this, this, this traditional model of thinking hasn't worked in a long time. 
Um, so what you have, the dark blue line is GDP, just aggregate GDP, not growth, but you can see GDP is generally growing. Um, corporate profits in, in green. So these are the profits that corporations report for tax purposes. There is no denominator, it's just aggregate corporate profits. And then the S&P 500 index in light blue. And so what you see is prior to approximately 2013, which was when the Fed did quantitative easing three, which before this most recent bout of quantitative easing, whatever we want to call it, infinity, that was the shock and awe moment when the Fed said, I'm just going to buy billions of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities and add to the money supply every month for as long as I think necessary. That was the shock and awe moment. So prior to that, the growth model made a lot of sense. You see, all these lines are generally moving together. GDP growth falls, so do corporate profits, so does the S&P 500. These things recover together. Since then, there is no correlation. The S&P 500 is up significantly. GDP growth has been humming along at a slower trend rate than we've seen in prior decades. And corporate profits are actually down since 2013. And they're actually down since 2005 in aggregate, which is crazy to think about. You have all that growth in the S&P 500, and in aggregate, we actually have fewer corporate profits, less in terms of corporate profits than we did in 2005. So yeah. the growth model just hasn't been working. So, so what, what broke in 2013 that the Fed decided we've got to pursue this path and led to this sort of outcome here? That was, uh, so once again, going back to the hammer and the nail, um, the, the nail got harder and harder to, uh, to put into the wood, basically. And so you needed a heavier and heavier hammer. QE3 implies that there was a QE1 and a QE2. And those, we talked about pushing on a string, how all this extra money actually doesn't create GDP growth or inflation in goods. And so after getting frustrated from QE1 and QE2, and seeing the market having negative reactions once those things expired, they finally said, all right, we're just going to go all in. At that time, that was all in. Mm -hmm. Obviously, right. this looks like now. <laughs> pennies compared to now. It's, it's yes. QE3. Just, it's, it looks nothing like it's going on now. But that was the first time they made it open-ended. That was the key moment. So QE1, QE2, there was a set time period. We're going to buy this much for this long, and then it's going to expire. And then growth is going to drive things again. QE3, it was open-ended. We're going to do it until we think it's okay to stop. To stop doing it. And that open-ended nature is what basically allowed stock investors to think, wow, uh, you know, clearly uh, growth is not driving anything anymore. I just need to buy whatever the Fed's going to buy or, or buy whatever looks good because of what the Fed is doing. Because this could be going on literally forever. So let's contrast that to the wealth model and show how that correlates to what's happening in the market. So the wealth model is a different starting point. You start with money supply. So that's in the dark blue with the shaded area. And that's just going up into the right. Money supply has been growing at a much faster clip than GDP growth. And right now it's gone exponential. The Fed is adding to the money supply faster than they ever have in history. So that's going up into the right then you have that increase in money results in lower cost of capital. So here, what we're showing as a proxy for cost of capital is the yield on U.S. corporate investment grade bonds. And that's the only line that's going down. So that's the dark green. So yields on corporate investment grade bonds are, have more than been cut in half since 2005. So very cheap for corporations to borrow money. Anybody, any, any wealthy person, it's relatively, it's very cheap for them to borrow money right now. Um, so cost of capital going down, earnings per share going up. That's the light green. Earnings per share have basically kept pace with the market. Um, and stock prices finally in the light blue, the S&P 500 index going up. So you look at that money supply, earnings per share, and S&P 500 index since 2013, all going up and to the right in beautiful harmony, showing that this model, this model works. It has been working, whereas the growth model has not. Right. Um, yeah. I don't know what your works works in terms of forecasting. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> works in terms of stimulating the economy. Clearly, that's not the case. Um, 
So on the next slide, we really look at the an info sort of an infographic picture of the wealth effect, uh, which which I like because it, it puts into perspective some of the key drivers. So can you sort of walk us through this infographic? Mm -hmm. And keep in mind as we go through here, uh, GDP growth is not required anywhere. This is all just more money leading to inflated stock prices. Um, so you start with the Fed increases the money supply. How do they do that? Well, they lower interest rates and they buy assets or some derivation of that, but it's always lowering interest rates and buy assets. That results in a lower cost of capital, not just for corporations, but basically anyone who has wealth and can get access to capital, they can get it very cheaply. Um, and, and once these entities have very low cost of capital, they can borrow cheaply, they can roll over their debt cheaply. They, th there are three effects three components of the wealth effect that ultimately drive higher stock prices. First is the buyback effect. So a simple example is uh, a company has 100 shares outstanding. So their earnings per share are $100. Then they borrow debt. So they borrow in the debt market and they buy back half their shares. They have just doubled their earnings per share mm -hmm. without actually create, creating any more profits. Their profits are identical but their mm -hmm. earnings per share have doubled simply because they're able to use debt to buy back shares. And, and made themselves wealthier, obviously. Yes, yes. Um, and then the next one is the supply and demand effect. So these companies are taking shares out of the market. So you simply have fewer shares. You have more money, which is the start of this equation, but fewer shares to invest in. So if you look at a traditional supply and demand chart, well, that means the price is going to go up. Mm -hmm. And then the last one uh, is the, the present value effect. So this one is probably going to resonate more for uh, you know, viewers who are familiar with defined benefit pension plans or in bond markets. But basically, you can look at a stock as just a stream of future cash flows future earnings. This stock's going to make earnings, X, X amount of earnings or profits in year 10, year 12, so on and so forth. And you just discount those earnings back to today to get what the stock price should be today. Mm -hmm. Now, what rate you use to discount those earnings, that is where the present value effect comes in. You know, In 2005, you might have used a discount rate that was twice as high as the one you use today. So this, when you do that, when you reduce the discount rate, the present value or the current stock price goes up. Uh, the same exact exact cash flows, but today because the discount rate is lower, because the cost of capital is lower, they're just worth more today. So those three factors you see, no growth required, can really support asset prices and drive them higher. And, and as a corollary, every pension plan manager in the world um, is suffering from that problem of right. valuing their liabilities at a much lower interest rate, which is basically bankrupting a lot of these pension plans. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want to be, I don't want us to come across as like being downers to use, a, to use a term on the market and on the economy and on what's going on. Um, but, but through the wealth model, uh, if we look at it, are stocks really expensive? Yeah, that's, that, that is a great question. So on the next slide, start to think, are stocks expensive? Um, and the first thing is you would value them using the growth model. So we know the, the, the best predictor of your future returns far out into the future is the price you pay today. If mm -hmm. you pay too much today, you're going to get lower returns in the future. If you get a deal today, you'll get higher returns in the future. So a great starting point if you're trying to predict future stock returns are what is the price you pay today? And that is open to interpretation. Someone who still follows the growth model or uses the growth model, um, the, in a very reliable indicator, it was more reliable before 2013, but still a very reliable indicator, is you take the total value of the U.S. stock market. So you take the market cap of every stock in the U.S. stock market and you sum them together. And you divide that by the total amount of GDP. So you say, how valuable is the stock market relative to the U.S. economy? When the stock market gets expensive relative to the economy, then you say, stocks are expensive, I don't want to buy. By that metric, uh, that's the light blue line, 
stocks are in the 99th percentile of expensiveness. Um, so extremely expensive, almost the most expensive in history. Mm -hmm. And what also is important is they have been the most expensive in history since early 2018. So for quite some time now. Mm -hmm. So if that's the model you're following, you think growth is permanently impaired. Well, you probably wouldn't be owning stocks for a long time now. You might be on your third year of owning no equities. Um, but then if you just change your point of reference and you think, well, now I'm going to take the total value of the stock market and divide it by the money supply, what you'll see is stocks actually don't look that expensive. Uh, relative to history, stocks are in the 63rd percentile of expensiveness. Still expensive. expensive. I mean, we're not tough to, tough to drive <laughs> a model that says stocks are cheap right now, right. but they're palatable yeah. at 63rd percentile. You know, that, that means much better things for future returns than 99th percentile. Yeah. So uh, in, in conclusion or how we sort of look to, to wrap all this up, if we were to look forward to what the expected returns for the stock market would be, you know, in the next five, 10 years, how would we think about that under these models? Yeah, you would draw very different conclusions. Um, so uh, if we look at future return implications here on, on the next slide, um, a bit of a busy chart, but basically what we see is whether you're using the growth model or the wealth model, these, these valuation indicators, they, they really only are useful if you're trying to forecast returns out to the next 10 years. You know, over the next 10 years, the primary driver of your returns is gonna be what you pay today. Over the next one year, it could be just about anything sentiment, it could be what the Fed does, whatever. But over 10 years, it's what you pay. So what we have, the orange line is actual 10-year rolling returns on the S&P 500. Those are annualized returns. If you think of that line as just a collection of individual dots, every single dot is like looking in your rearview mirror and seeing the last 10 years. Okay. Then that obviously stops at 2020 because we have no more data. So now we're trying to predict future returns. The, the wealth model would predict that you would have a return over the next 10 years of 5.6% annualized. That's, that's really good, mm -hmm. relatively speaking. I mean, that's lower than long-term stock returns. You're used to getting 6 to 8%, but compare that to what you get on cash right now, which is zero, or high-quality government bonds, which is close to zero. That's a win. Right. Um, versus... The growth model in the light blue, well, currently that's predicting future returns of negative 5% annualized, losing 5% per year, every year for the next 10 years. So if that's your model, you would, not only would you not own any stocks right now, you would be short the stock market. <laughs> right. And think about how difficult that would have been if you were short the stock market the last three months. Yeah, over the last three years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So very different conclusions for portfolio construction. And they've never been more different. That's the mm -hmm. key. They have never, they they've never said such different things at the same time. And that's why it's important to bring awareness to this different idea of what drives stock returns. Um, because you know, going forward, it means it it's the difference between a successful financial outcome and not. Right. Yeah, it's a stark difference. And so what implications does this have for asset allocation and how you think about asset allocation and how the listeners should think about allocating their portfolio? The, the first thing is if you're, if you're following the growth model, I mean, you're budgeting negative returns on your stock. So you're saying, I'm not going to own any of those. And then you think, well, what can I own? Well, you go back to cash is giving you a yield of zero, and most high-quality bonds are giving you next to zero. So then you start factoring into when you're trying to forecast your financial outcome, you're saying, well, I, I think I'll get 0% returns out of my wealth for the next 10 years. And in order to make that math work, what you're going to have to do is save a lot more, spend a lot less. Right. Um, you're going to have to make significant contributions to your pension plan. You're going to have to pay off liabilities. Um, fix your break. balance sheet. You have to. Exactly. You're basically you're going to fix your balance sheet. 
Right, right. right. And, and the Fed knows that. The Fed doesn't want people to forecast using the growth model. You know, that's why they've been doing what they've been doing. Um, but for the wealth model, you think, okay, you know, if I can get, if I can get five to 6% returns, where can I do that? Basically just the equity market. And then, you know, where can I get income? Basically just the equity market. <laughs> so it's a very different conclusion. Right. Uh, and, and you just go out and you look at dividend yields of high quality dividend paying stocks right now, and you can get four to 5% out of the most high quality dividend paying stocks. You can work with that. Mm -hmm. That's something that can actually support your financial goals. So, you know, a very different conclusion puts you in a very different place and it drives very different behavior. And if you're looking, if, if you're looking at this the wrong way, you know, it can be very costly, very, very costly. Well, this has been great. We appreciate uh, you walking us through this in, in a much deeper dive and look forward to our next session of Uncapped, where we'll go into sort of the broader effect of this on the economy and, and individual companies and what we call zombie companies yeah. and how it impacts investment ideas going forward. <laughs>